hello, everyone, or as Ken would say, hello, hello, and welcome to another edition of Things We Said Today, the Beatle podcast where we talk about anything and everything having to do with the Beatles together or apart, um, and we do it every other week, give or take, maybe. I'll try to keep to that uh, pattern. My name is Darren DeVivo. I'm from WFUV Radio in New York City. I've been broadcasting at WFUV now for 40 years, 90.7 FM on the dial in the New York metropolitan area. Or you could listen anywhere, uh, anywhere in the world at WFUV.org and uh, listen on our app. And uh, I'm on the air four nights a week, late nights and uh, Saturday afternoons as well. And in addition to joining Ken and Alan here on Things We Said Today. And we have a special show today. We have a guest coming up. I'll tell you more about that in a second. First, let me introduce Ken Michaels. Um, Ken was, uh, he was an originator when it comes to Things We Said Today. Ken's been in broadcasting now a little longer than I've been, over 40 years, most of that time doing Beatles-related uh, work in radio and currently hosts a syndicated program called Every Little Thing. Ken will share with us later on where we can go to listen to Every Little Thing. In addition to that, in addition to hosting this show, uh, he is a co-host of Talk More Talk, which is a solo Beatles video podcast. And Ken runs his own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, which is packed to the rafters with special guests, interviews, games, lessons on on bow hunting and all kinds of other crazy things. Um, just go to YouTube and search Ken Michaels Radio if you want to find out how you can clean your old baseball caps and they won't get ruined. Ken, great to see you again. Good to see you. Yes, I have expanded to bow hunting. You know, I'm trying to look for, for new and exciting ways and more features for people to follow me by in my, my podcast shows and my website, you name it. I'll cover it all. And, and also Alan Cozen, who has the audacity to wear a Yankee shirt. No, I'm just kidding. Congratulations, Alan, to the Yankees for winning the American League Championship. Which is I a- was October ready. <laughs> and I will be October ready again in 2025. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I want, sure it, you... I want it to be the Yankees and the Mets, but I like the Dodgers too. Yeah. So it's it, it should be. the Yankees. You know what I was finding with you know Ken and I, hardcore Met fans, and I think many of you probably pick up on my you know I'm always like a Met billboard. If you look on my Facebook pages, when it ended for the Mets, I did think one thing: I can relax now <laughs> because it was stressful. Mm. Every day, are they going to win? Are they going to score 10 runs today? Or what's going to uh, so? I, uh, in a way, thought not going to relax this week and you know, watch the World Series. And if things aren't going the way I like, Doesn't put matter. on the great British mm-hmm. big show or something else, you know, and not have any anyway. Alan Cozen's our other guest host here on uh, things we said today. Alan's been, um. Uh, been well alan's been writing since he was a little kid but as an author and a journalist and a critic uh we're talking over 40 years of course right now these days the focus is on the mccartney legacy volume one published we're talking over two years now i believe and that's the red book uh to my left behind alan the blue book is the second volume coming December 10th. Right. Now, Alan and Adrian Sinclair wrote both volumes. Um, and as I mentioned, the blue one, uh, which covers the years 1974 to 1980, the beginning of 80, mm-hmm. uh, will be out mm-hmm. in December. Alan's also written other books uh, on the Beatles and uh, classical music and whatnot. And wrote for the, you can read his works in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. Alan Cozen, our other host here on Things We Said Today. Hello, Alan. Hello, Darren, and hello, Ken, and hello, everyone out there. Now, we have a special guest waiting in the rafters, um, and... I thought he was in the wind. We're going to do a show today celebrating the 50th anniversary. What? He's in... Actually, he should be waiting in the wings, not in the rafters, right? So, 
Our guest is in the wings. Uh, we didn't stick him in the rafters. Uh, today we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of John Lennon's album Walls and Bridges, which uh, celebrated its actual 50th anniversary about a month ago, as it was released in late September 1974. So Walls and Bridges coming up, but first we turn it over to Ken for the news. Okay. Before I start that, I just thought of a great idea for, for Alan and for Adrian. Since you have the red and the blue covers there behind you, why don't you have a contest where the fans could pick the next color for volume three? Will it be like, you know, the Beatles had the red and the blue album and they had the white album? Should it be white? We're, or have you already we're decided? We're not ceding control of our palette. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually also getting like the band Weezer because they have like five or six self-titled albums identified by the color. So they've got a teal album, blue album, white album, black album, red album. So. Yeah, maybe when we're finished with the Legacy series, we'll turn to them. Okay. <laughs> All right, news boy, literate. I tell you, there's been so much news since the last show. And when I did my other podcast, Talk More Talk, there was like a half hour of news. Go watch that show. <laughs> You'll get all the news there. But actually, since then, there's been a whole bunch of other stuff. And we'll highlight some of the older news as well. Uh, the big news of the past week is that Ringo Starr announced his new country album to be called Look Up, which will be released on January the 10th. There are 11 songs on the album, nine of which were co-written by T-Bone Burnett, who produced the album, and one of the songs was made available online. It's called Time on My Hands. Ringo has several guest stars on the album, including Billy Strings, Molly Tuttle, the sister duo Larkin Poe, another famous duo, Lucius, uh, and on the last song, Alison Krauss. That song, by the way, uh, with Allison is called Thankful, and Ringo co-wrote the song with Bruce Sugar. He also has one called You Want Some, written by Billy Swan of I Can hmm. Help. Uh, the track list includes these song titles. I'll just read the titles. Breathless, Look Up, Time on My Hands, Never Let Me Go, I Live for Your Love, Come Back, Can You Hear Me Call, Rosetta, You Want Some, String Theory, and Thankful. Unfortunately, you know, we, we've been talking to Gary Burr a lot, and he told me, he told us on our podcast that um, he's written a song for the New Country album, and I guess plans change because it's not on there, unfortunately. Um, Ringo will also be a guest on uh, Talk Shop Live, actually today. <laughs> so I don't know if on this internet station, if you can... You can play it back if it's on demand at all. Uh, but it's scheduled for today, October 22nd at 7 p.m. Also, speaking of Talk Shop Live, Julian Lennon will be on the channel on October the 28th at 3 p.m. This is Eastern Time to discuss his new photo book called Life's Fragile Moments. And you'll be able to ask him questions during the broadcast. And you'll be able to pre-order signed copies of his book. Now... One very big surprise that caught us all off guard here is that the CEO for the Beatles Apple uh, company, Apple Corps, Jeff Jones, is stepping down from his position. He has led the company from 2007 to the present. He oversaw such projects as the Beatles Love, the documentary Eight Days a Week, The Touring Years, the archival Beatles box sets, the Get Back documentary. He's also listed as the executive producer for the upcoming documentary called Beatles 64, directed by Martin Scorsese. He was also instrumental in making the Beatles music available digitally on iTunes. No word as to who was going to replace him, but I don't think any of us saw this coming. You guys want to say anything about this, about Jeff Jones? Because, wow, what a legacy he's left at Apple. He did. He, uh, I think he was a, was pretty important for Apple. I mean, um, Neil Aspinall, his predecessor, was also an important guy just in the Beatles story generally. But the thing about Neil was that um, apart from 
the anthology, um, he seemed a little disinclined to do archival reissues. Um, even things like, you know, when I interviewed him around the time of, of anthology and I said, you know, so <laughs> what about just a video of all the Beatles promo videos? You know, everybody wants those. We're all collecting them in sort of copy down state. And he said, oh yeah, but that's too obvious. And yeah, a lot of things are obvious. And we want them. We want the obvious stuff as well as the <laughs> not obvious stuff. But that was Neil's philosophy. When Jeff Jones came in, it was completely different. You know, we now have these archival boxes. Uh, some of them have been better than others. And, uh, you know, we could be critical about this or that. Um, but also, you know, there, there have been the film projects. Um, I'd rather see different stuff than a lot of what he's put out but um you know like eight days a week that to me that was a big wasted opportunity i mean it was sort of fun when it came out for a couple of weeks but i don't know if i'll ever watch that again i mean why you know i i, I wish he had just released full concerts you know that's what i want to see there are a number of them that can be released and should be released. And I hope his successor, whoever it is, does it. Um, and the other thing I, I wanted to say about the, the whole announcement of his leaving, which, as you said, caught us all by surprise. Um, and it doesn't say he's leaving at the end of next January. It, it, it doesn't say when he's leaving. It makes it sound like he's leaving as of now. And, mm -hmm. You know, as a, <laughs> someone who's been a, a, a journalist for like 50 years, um, you know, I look at a press release like that and I immediately say, hmm, there's no quote from Jeff Jones. There's no quote from Paul. There's no quote from Ringo. It's like three paragraphs long. It's very friendly and it's got the classic, you know, he's wants to spend time doing other pursuits, which they always say. Um it makes me sort of wonder what went on, you know, and um, we'll probably never find out. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of people with theories about what went on when Neil left as well. Um, so I'm just kind of curious. I I, uh, I hope some information trickles out, but I think he did a really good job, generally speaking, and uh, I'm sorry to see him go. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's 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 interesting a lot of hosts on Beatle podcasts, you know, they theorize and and they uh, they don't know the full reasons, as we don't, why certain things come out and why certain other things don't come out. And for what you were just saying there, Alan, you'd rather see, you know, full Beatle concerts come out or, uh, you know, something like that. How do you know the Beatles didn't block it? You know, you can't put it all on on Jeff Jones. Okay, uh, I'm not putting it all on Jeff Jones. I'm just saying, I'm just saying what I would have wanted to see versus what came out. Okay, right. You know? But I also remember hearing what you said about Neil Espinall. He was very guarded, mm. uh, very protective of the Beatles' legacy. He didn't want anything below par to come out. And even, and we we bring this up every now and then. The whole story behind um the Beatles sessions and when when uh Dave Morell from Capitol Records met with Paul McCartney and and the Beatles blocked sessions coming out at the time and Paul said to Dave well you know if you want to hear uh I am the walrus this is the real version this is the one you should be listening to not an outtake you know so for all these box sets to come out on the Beatles they had to change their minds about this, <laughs> Paul and Ringo. They had to start being a little bit more open to this whole idea. So Jeff must have been very involved in convincing them because we've been having, you know, since Sgt. Pepper, all these box sets coming out. We're still waiting for the rest of the catalog. But who knows if that would ever have happened if Jeff wasn't there. Darren, did you want to add anything? No, uh, I mean, Alan pretty much hit you know, hit on everything I would say. I was surprised by it. I didn't really, like, 
try to read between the lines. Initially, I thought maybe it was just time for him to move on. But now hearing what the two of you are saying, perhaps, yeah, there is something kind of happening behind the scenes that we probably never will uh, find out. Jeff, it was funny because Apple was always very, um, uh, everything uh, you know, everything was in-house. Neil Aspinall goes back to the Liverpool, the Cavern days. And when Jeff Jones came in, it was sort of like the first time an outsider, right, came into a position of any prominence within the Beatles world. Um, but he did, uh, at least it seems he, you know, ran a good ship. Yeah. Why are we talking about now him stepping down? Who knows? Yeah. Hmm. You know, look, and it could be anything. It could be on, on one hand, it could be some philosophical dispute with Paul and Ringo. On the other hand, you know, maybe he's not well, you know, maybe he's stepping down for medical reasons. We don't, we just don't know. Um, right. But, and, and, you know, I mean, I suppose you could argue that they are not under any obligation to tell us, but the thing is that by not telling us, you start conversations like this, you know, mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I'm always for complete transparency where possible. Okay. Okay. But we should never jump to any conclusions at all. Anyway, um, news breaking most recently about another documentary on the Beatles about to come out called Beatles 64. We didn't talk about this in the last show. This is all what's happened in the last few weeks. It's being produced by Martin Scorsese and directed by David Tedeschi. It'll be streamed exclusively on Disney Plus beginning November 29th. The film captures the electrifying moment of the Beatles' first visit to America. It features never-before-seen footage of the band and the legion of young fans who helped fuel their ascendance. The film gives a rare glimpse into when the Beatles became the most influential and beloved band of all time. It includes footage of the Beatles on The Ed Sullivan Show, their first concert in the U.S. at the Washington Coliseum, some rare footage shot by Albert and David Mazels, demixed by Wingnut Films, that's Peter Jackson and his team, and remixed by Giles Martin. There will be newly filmed interviews with Paul and Ringo, as well as fans whose lives were transformed by the Beatles. And coinciding with this film is the just-announced Beatles box set of American albums in mono from 1964. So what do you think about this news? Are you excited about this documentary? I mean, most well, I'm most curious about the uh, Maisel's footage that we haven't seen. Yeah. Yeah, the footage we haven't seen is obviously the the big draw um how much of that there's going to be who knows because you got to assume they've they've put out beatles first u.s visit really twice already um a short version and then a, a two a two dvd set with a lot more of the mazel's footage footage which um, was really interesting more of what went on on the train to washington and you know and it was great stuff and but you kind of think, I mean, just logically, that they probably used what they considered when they were making those films the best stuff. So is the new stuff going to be stuff where we're going to say, wow, why didn't they release that? Or are we going to say, well, okay, yeah, um, more of them sitting around the hotel room not doing much. Um, you know, who knows? Um, what? Having said that, what I would really want would be a complete archival dump of all the Maisel's footage. Obviously. Because, you know, seeing it edited into like, what is this going to be a 90 minute or two hour film? Um, I'm wondering how different it can be from what we've seen. And I'll, it, I'll be very pleasantly surprised if it is, you know, but, but let's see. Yeah. Well, that would be, I'm actually, that would be what? That would be a dream if they released all of it. Because no matter what, with every documentary, you have limitations because of it being either 90 minutes or two hours. There's only so much you can put in there. And probably some of that has to be footage that we've seen already. Uh, you know, probably most of it, really, if you, you mm -hmm. know, to be honest. 
Um, and since it's Disney, you know, there's obviously going to be, uh, you know, a fight over whether or not it comes out on DVD and Blu-ray. Um, and all I have to say is that if, if it does come out on Blu-ray, um, you know, if we're talking about a, a 90 minute or, or two hour film, they're obviously not going to show us the complete Washington Coliseum concert and the complete Sullivan shows. But those should be bonus features on the Blu-ray. Hmm. I mean, the Washington Coliseum show, you know, if if the Beatles themselves say, well, you know, we're very protective of our image and we don't want that out. I would just have to say you guys are just crazy because that is an incredible performance. It really is, you know, Ringo's drumming everything about that performance. Okay, you know, the they had to turn around the stage and, you know, was, uh, you know, wobbly mic at one point. But so what? The performance is incredible. And Not only that, that did come out commercially. It, well, it only came out as a download in the right. iTunes version of, you know, and, and yes, we've all made DVDs of it for ourselves, but... They should put it out as a Blu-ray, especially if if now we're going to have a stereo mix of it. You know, hmm. it should come out complete. Okay, I have spoken. All right. Um, I was just going to say, Alan has spoken. <laughs> well, I tell you, a little confused at uh, all these movies coming out because uh, in trying to make a list for our for for this show for us in house here. Um, I can't figure out what some of these films are and when they're coming out, where they're coming out, where you're going to be able to see them. Um, the one-to-one -one, uh, John Lennon, Yoko Ono uh, documentary seems to have, not that it's not happening, but it's when is that going to be available? And is Midas Man available on on, uh, on uh, Netflix yet? <laughs> you know? Well, you know, as we find out, we report it here. And I'd also like to remind everybody not to, you know, make this a cheap plug, but on my website, I have a page, Upcoming Releases, and everything is done chronologically of everything that I mentioned here. You know, I think Midas Man is uh, the end of November, a DVD release, and Blu-ray, I'm pretty sure. But it's all and, and Daytime Revolutions also, I think, November yeah. on a Blu-ray DVD. Right. But, like, if I want to watch it now... I know we have our own little because right. we're important. We have, you know, uh, we can watch, we can watch it. <laughs> but, you know, if I wanted to, I don't know. Anyway, continue. Don't listen to me. Turn my mic off, please. With the exciting news of the archival box set coming for George Harris's 1973 number one album for Living in the Material World, comes word from Danny Harrison who was on the Chris Evans Breakfast Show on Virgin Radio in the UK and revealed that the concert for Bangladesh is being worked on and Peter Jackson is involved in restoring the film. Danny uh, just gave a few concerts in Europe this month, October 13th in Berlin, October 15th in Paris, and October 21st, actually that's today as we're recording this, in London. And Danny's new concert film called Inner Soundstage is now available to stream on his website, dannyharrison.com. Uh, Luca Parasi is at it again with more new books for Beatle fans. He has just released a two-volume series called The Beatles After the Beatles, The Solo Careers of John, Paul, George, and Ringo, 1967 to 1980. So he's trying to make it, you know, compatible with, with Alan and Adrian's book since that goes to 1980. So Luca is doing the same thing. Both are available as a paperback and hardcover. Um, Amazon described the books as covering the main events of their lives, their their records, their tours and concerts, anecdotes and curiosities, lesser known facts and statements, uh, their public and private fights, their various interests and businesses, the battle for Apple, and the invincible myth of their past that follows them everywhere. It's now available for purchase. Rolling Stone reports a new documentary Boy, there's so many documentaries. It's coming out on the late session keyboardist Nikki Hopkins. 
and it's called Session Man, The Session Man. Apart from playing on the Beatles' classic recording of Revolution, he is also one of only two musicians in the world, other than a Beatle, who can say they appeared on solo albums from all four of the Beatles. He also played on nearly every Rolling Stones album from 1967 through 81, was a founding member of the Jeff Beck Group, and who the Kinks wrote about in their song, Session Man. The new documentary is set for digital release November 5th on Amazon Prime and other platforms. Thank you, Tom Brennan, for that information. Um, something here about James McCartney. <laughs> He's just released a new album. It's a new collection of songs called Beautiful Nothing. On his Facebook page, James wrote, I am so excited to bring you Beautiful Nothing during the period of this period of, of composing and recording, I did find it challenging at times. However, it was an all-round fulfilling, exciting, and rewarding experience. And James's dad wrote, <laughs> I'm a proud dad today as my son James releases his latest collection of songs. Give it a listen here. There are 12 tracks altogether, a mixture of new and old songs. No information as to what is available other than digitally for it being released. So if any of you watching this have any idea if there's any physical release i haven't seen that yet now this is confusing i had reported at first that james knew a song called i'm yours was co-written with sean lennon but when i looked for proof of that at the time i couldn't find it people were writing in on my facebook post oh sean co-wrote it nowhere was it found anywhere to make it official so then i said it wasn't written by the two of them well, now on the Paul McCartney Project website, it lists all the songs in the collection, and it does say that I'm Yours was indeed written with Sean Lennon, which means it's two songs James wrote with Sean following the release of Primrose Hill. One new thing to learn about I'm Yours is that Paul is playing bass and guitar on the song. Not only that, the song Beautiful, which James released earlier this year, it says on this website was written by Paul and James together. And that on James's song called Nothing, Paul plays the spinet. Some news that I just picked up today. Rolling Stone is writing that the console that Abbey Road Studios had installed in 1969, for which the Beatles recorded the Abbey Road album, and the first solo Beatle albums were used, those being... Uh, Plastic on Old Band, McCartney, Sentimental Journey, and All Things Must Pass, is about to go on sale on October 29th on Reverb. The board is the original EMI TG12345 prototype, and Dave Harries, an engineer who worked with the Beatles during those sessions, credited the console as the reason Abbey Road, the album, sounds so good. He says, quote, the album has a distinctive sound that hallmark the future of pop recording. This particular console is a one-off. It's unique. You can't replace it. It sounds so good that it holds up against any modern console, and in many respects, it's probably better. Because in those days, it was built to a different standard. Cost. No object. EMI built this to be the best in the world. End of quote. New models of the TG12345 were made, and this prototype was disassembled and stashed away, and it hasn't been used in more than five decades. But five years ago, the console was taken out of storage for restoration. People can make offers for the console, but it will be sold at a fixed price directly by the owner. It's expected to fetch in the millions. In 2017, a TG12345 console used to record Paul McCartney, Kate Bush, The Cure, and one of Darren's favorite albums, Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, sold for $18 million at an auction. A few reminders here. David Spinoza, the great session guitar player, um, he is putting on a concert at the Cutting Room in New York City on November the 17th at 4 p.m. Eastern. This is a concept that he came up with himself. It's called Spin the Beatles Big Band. It's big band arrangements of Beatles songs. He has a 17-piece orchestra. He's conducting it. And Kenny Asher is part of the band. So David and Kenny, both playing on the Mind Games album, you can see them together for this show. Again, that's at the Cutting Room in New York City, November 17th at 4 p.m. 
Okay. You can go to the cutting room, nyc.com for more information. And the George Harrison tribute, also known as Harry Fest is taking place as it has been for the last 20 years now, uh, November 1st and 2nd at whites of Westport, Massachusetts, uh, for those two days, you're going to find local artists performing George Harrison's music, plus Beatles, Beatles-related music. There'll also be raffles, trivia, lots of fun. I will be there on the Saturday, November the 2nd. So if you happen to be in the area and you feel like going, come on and mingle with me. We'll talk shop. We'll talk Beatles while all this is going on. Okay? And uh, And that's about it. All right. Thank you, Ken. Uh, and now it's time uh, to introduce our guest uh, and to begin our look at Walls and Bridges on its 50th anniversary, John Lennon's album released September 1974. It gives me great pleasure to welcome author Chip Mattinger. It's time to celebrate Walls and Bridges and with us is our good friend Chip Mattinger. Um, who is an expert on all things, why don't we just say all things Beatles and sum it up that way. And we decided to call on Chip because of his work with the John Lennon catalog. Um, and it's great to have you back here on Things We Said Today, Chip. Thanks, Darren. Alan, yeah. Ken, appreciate it. Uh, I, uh, tell us what you've been up to and what we're going to be hearing from you um, in the near future. Um, I don't know of anything in the real near future. We've just made a major house move, so I'm still kind of getting organized. And, and this week was spent trying to sort out all the hard drives. So, <laughs> you know, it, it, <laughs> it's eminent. But, uh, yeah, I, I've just been wrestling with getting into the new house. Right, right. Okay, so instead, what we'll do is go back. We're going to okay. look back now to 50 years. I have to put it in my head that it's... 50, and it's hard to believe that we're talking 50 years about uh, anything having to do with the 1970s. But um, John Lennon's album, Walls and Bridges, just passed its 50th anniversary. And our focus has been on, when it comes to John Lennon, mind games, of course, because the big, big box set uh, just recently came out. And uh, But in reality, 74, 2024, it's the 50th anniversary of the follow-up to mind games which is Walls and Bridges, an album that's important to me because it's probably my favorite John Lennon album um, of, of all of his records. And I've come, I've grown to uh, love Walls and Bridges and Mind Games even more so than, uh, uh, say, Imagine. Um, so let's spend a little time talking about Walls and Bridges and start off with uh, Chip, your thoughts on the album and lead us into this little look back 50 years to uh, uh, this this wonderful work from John Lennon. Well, I, I've always appreciated the album, probably because it's got, you know, it's got a little more a harder edge in spots, you know, scared, uh, for example. And uh, production is another step up from Mind Games, I think. Uh, and, you know, the, the songs are all there this time. I mean, Mind Games was, you know, Pretty good song selection wise, but I, I don't think there are really any dogs on Walls and Bridges. Yeah, and I love, I love, um, I mean, I love the, the this sort of fun vibe John uh, usually put on his albums, songs like Meat City on Mind Games. But here on Walls and Bridges, we have What You Got, which is just a great rocker and one of my favorite John Lennon songs, and Beef Jerky, uh, if you could call it an instrumental, a somewhat instrumental. Um, that's part of Walls and Bridges as well. Now, I, I, I could share maybe one of the reasons why this album has become near and dear to me is the way I was uh, turned on to the album, and that was in the aftermath of John Lennon's murder. Uh, when John was killed, I was 15, and I really didn't have a very big um, Lennon record collection at 15. I mean, I was a huge Beatles fan, and uh, Ken and Alan will attest to this. I was a huge McCartney and Wings guy first. And um, I, it didn't help that John had kind of dropped off the radar for five years. 
um, you know, as I was getting older and now maybe inclined to buy a new album or, you know, take my Christmas money and pick up uh, a Lennon solo album. At the time of John's death, all I really owned was Shaved Fish and a few singles. Um, John was murdered on a Monday and um, by the end of the week, I really wanted to go down to the Dakota from having seen all the coverage uh, on the news. I'm from New York and from the Bronx. And so it was pretty convenient. Uh, I mean, I was 15 and to me, Manhattan was like another planet when you're from the Bronx and you live in your sheltered little world. Um, but I wanted to go down to the Dakota just to, even if it was for five minutes, just to be there. And I brought a flower down and my dad and mom uh, drove me down to uh, West 72nd Street. And it was rather surreal, sad, all, all gloomy. Um, all of the flowers had been removed from the gate. If you recall the coverage when John, sure. was, they plastered the gate of the Dakota with flowers. They were all gone by Friday. Uh, and I was down there on Friday late afternoon after school. And, but I had a flower and I gave it to the doorman. Um, I didn't give it, well, I gave it to the doorman to take the Yoko. It wasn't my turn, a, a way to endear myself to the doorman. Uh, and I asked him probably, would you mind? I'm sure it didn't get up there, but. And uh, people were still hanging out outside the Dakota. And I heard um, what clearly was John Lennon music playing out of uh, a boom box that was uh, down the block a bit. There was a guy sitting by himself leaning up against the concrete wall uh, at the Dakota, just just sitting there. He was staring out into space and he had his boom box playing. Turns out he was listening to Walls and Bridges, uh, which I didn't know at the time. I knew the name. That was about it. And why did things click when we're young? You know what I mean? Why do mm -hmm. certain things resonate and stick that you can remember years and years and years later, but yet I couldn't tell you what time I woke up this morning, but that day it, it just locked in. And I went over to him and asked him, what were you, what are you listening to? And he showed me the cassette box walls and bridges. From that point on, there's something about that album that um, takes me back to that time, that time of the year, uh, the very late fall, um, fall ending winter beginning in the, sadness that we all felt at that time and i've carried that with me to this day so i thought it would be important that we should acknowledge walls and bridges here on the show uh let me uh, go to ken and ken you um um share some thoughts your thoughts as opposed to sharing alan's thoughts about walls and bridges well usually whenever i talk about this period um i was glued to the radio and very heavily following the solo careers of the Beatles. And certainly that time of 1973 and 74 was the most successful from all four of them. It was a, an incredible time to be a Beatles fan when you considered the fact that Ringo had his most successful album in 73 with Ringo and then following that with Goodnight Vienna. And Paul had so much success with Wings at that time. And George came off of a, a number one album with Living in the Material World and then Dark Horse, a top 10 album in 74. And he toured that year. Um, so there's all this activity. And I always loved the Mind Games album and, and Walls and Bridges back to back. Maybe there is this part of me that feels that I I came to know Mei Pang um, in the 80s. She's, she was a guest on my show on the radio a few times, and she put me in this frame of mind of during this lost weekend period that it was the most productive period of John's solo career. Well, it all depends on how you look at it, really. It all depends on how you view Mind Games, which was really recorded when John was still with Yoko anyway but it was released when John was away from Yoko. But still, you had Walls and Bridges, you had the rock and roll album, the beginning of the rock and roll album um, mm -hmm. in L.A., and then finishing that up in February of 75. You had Elton John working with John Lennon. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds was a number one hit. 
you had uh david bowie working with john on fame although that was that was february wasn't it in 75 That was 75, bro. Mm -hmm. no but i know it's 75 but it was was it when john was back with yoko i can't It remember was that week, I believe. I think he 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 did the Bowie session. I, I don't have the file in front of me, but I think it was February 5th. yeah And and he just got back with her in, in that first week of February. Yeah. So you had that, and Fame was a number one record. Working with Ringo on Goodnight Vienna, working with Harry Nilsson on Pussycats, all these side things, rock and roll people being given to Johnny Winter. There was so much productivity out of John. So, you know, I have a, a really uh, fond look at that particular period because so much came out of John. Although we could debate whether or not it wasn't as much as we think if you're just talking about when John was away from Yoko. Um, but I remember what radio played. I always remember rock radio in New York City playing not only Whatever Gets You Through the Night and Number Nine Dream, but they went really heavy on this album. They played Steel and Glass a lot. They played uh, Nobody, Nobody Loves You When You're Down and Out. I remember hearing Scared on the radio. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I also remember... Um, feeling like this was an even more produced album than mind games was it had a much fuller sound sonically it was an improvement although i like the production on mind games i never had a problem with it but there seemed to be a very big difference more more effort put into the production on the album but i have great memories of of uh when this album came out and loving it and listening to it every day but like i said part of the fun of that time was you had so much solo beetle product coming out all within, you know, a few years, that those were like glory days for me. And then once John stepped away from the public eye for five, five years, if you were lucky, in 76, you had three solo Beatles putting out music, but it was always less, you know? That period from 70 to 75, when there was so much music pouring out of John, Paul, George, and Ringo, will always be such a special time for me. And that doesn't mean that following 75, they didn't put out a lot of great solo music to follow. But I can easily group 73 and 74 and 75 together as this incredible time to be a Beatle fan. And Walls and Bridges was a very big part of it. I was a big, And Alan, oh, I still I'm sorry. am, but a big Elton fan. And I remember that that I remember the Elton and the Bowie tracks getting airplay in the Midwest here, but I don't remember either one of the John singles, which is hard to believe Wow. since, since it was number one. But uh, I'd have to go back and look at some of the, the charts from the, the radio stations here, but I'm, I'm sure drawing a blank on hearing those. I mean, we had the Neil Sedaka track with Elton, and I guess they did play whatever gets you through the night, but that's where my interest was more set at the time. So I, all my pocket money would go to be buying Elton albums and singles, but I would go look at the bins and, and check out the, the Lennon and the Harrison and the Paul and uh, kind of make a, a running list of, of what I wanted to get next. Yeah, I mean, Elton was at the the apex of his career. That was when it seemed like he had a new record out every week. You would watch the charts and you go, what, something else he's put out? And he also was achieving things that the Beatles did. I mean, debuting at number one with an album, which he did with Rock of the Westies and I think Captain Fantastic. Yeah, the first And, album to do that. yeah, so he could do no wrong. back then and he seemed to have a magic and you know part of the success obviously for whatever gets you through the night was the fact that elton was on it and i i always like to listen to early takes of whatever gets you through the night where it's a bit more laid back a version and when elton got involved he pumped it up <laughs> i mean it became like a very different song in a way and he brought so much liveliness to the record that it really helped to propel it to be Uh, a number one record and they sounded so good together they sounded natural together elton john and john Mm -hmm. I'm going to throw it to Alan for some walls and bridges. okay um you know my my memories of it at the time are fairly vague i remember liking it um and i remember feeling relieved that <clears throat> two albums of john in a row 
were pretty good albums because I was so disappointed by some time in New York City um, that, uh, you know, now that he was back to doing sort of what he did, uh, I, 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 I thought, you know, okay, sort of all is right with the world. Didn't realize he was going to then disappear for five years. Um, but also Walls and Bridges has sort of a special place because it's really his last album of original music before the five-year disappearance. And, you know, we got the rock and roll album after it, but um, that was an oldies album. And it's, you know, it was, uh, and I actually, um, actually when that came out, I was kind of disappointed in that too, um, just because uh, I think, you know, he was trying to sort of reinterpret these old rock classics and what I was expecting and I guess hoping for was sort of an album of the way he would have sung the stuff in Hamburg with the band sounding like the Beatles would have sounded in Hamburg. I, I hadn't really counted on him updating them and wanting to do them in a mid 1970s style, which, you know, now that I think of it that way, I appreciate that, that album a lot more than I did when it came out. Um, but walls and bridges, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've sort of been into the lore of walls and bridges a lot more recently because of working on volume two of legacy and, and we're increasingly trying to keep tabs on what the other Beatles are doing and how Paul is interacting with them and they're interacting with Paul. Um, so I spent a lot of time uh, while working that out in chips um, Leninology, which we haven't mentioned, and um, Ken, you should hold up your copy because this is, uh, you know, I can't even say Chip's magnum opus because you could call Eight Arms his magnum opus too. <laughs> so it's one of his magnum opuses. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it goes day, day by day what Lenin is doing. And, um, you know, in we have... You know, he goes to L.A. to talk to John about Yoko and they do the session, uh, you know, that, that became Toot and a Snore and uh, and and other things. And he's 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 sort of in touch with Paul at that time. And so I'm sort of trying to sync up the sources that we have with what Chip has and, you know, just make sure everything is right. So um, in the course of that, you know, I'm sort of, you know just reading Chip's book in like long stretches rather than just the stuff I'm actually looking for, because it's, it's very compelling. And, um, you know, we've got him working on the rock and roll album and then coming to New York and, you know, he's, 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 he's out of control to a degree in LA, um, partly because he's hanging out with other people who are out of control all the time, i.e. Harry Nilsson, Ringo, um, Good influences, all of them. Yeah, and they they influence each other and and uh, in in misbehavior, etc. Um, but John, you know, what what comes through Chip's book and May's books too uh, is that you know John really kind of wanted to get it all together, and so he decides to. Well, I think Spectre disappeared with. <laughs> with the rock and roll album tapes. Um, and so John is producing an album for Harry Nilsson, um, decides that he wants to get Harry away from LA, come to New York, work on it there, and is also working on his own album, which turns out to be Walls and Bridges. So it's kind of really a, um, a very kind of messy time, <laughs> um, but, it all comes together and, you know, the album came out like, like we didn't, I didn't know any of this at the time, you know, I mean, we knew about John, um, you know, coming out of a, a men's room in LA with a Kotex on his head. And, uh, you know, we've heard, we heard some of those stories of, of his misbehavior. We knew about, you know, John in May, what's going on with Yoko is, but you know, the, these weren't, um, they weren't like major headlines at the time. And so, you know, Walls and Bridges came out and it's okay. Here's that album that 
it's not the rock and roll album we thought it was going to be, but okay, maybe that's coming, you know. Um, and, you know, you got things on it. I mean, whatever gets you through the night really was, I mean, it's, I think it was his first number one, right, as a solo yeah. artist. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it deserves to be. I mean, I think other others of his earlier tracks deserve to be too. But, um, you know, and there's just a, a lot on this album, like Chip was saying, there's a harder edge and things like Scared and uh, Steel and Glass, um, which has always been taken to be about Klein, right? But John has sometimes said, well, it's, it's really about me. <laughs> to, to jump ahead into that, I, I get the feeling that it's it's mostly autobiographical. Oh, yeah. and But I think uh, I think there's definitely some Klein in it. And I think he's talking about Yoko in spots as well. Really? Mm, have to listen to that again. So, so give it a listen and see what you think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Nobody yeah. will take your calls. You know. You know, and then on the other hand, there's Bless You, and um, let's see, uh, Number Nine Dream, Surprise, Surprise is sort of halfway in between. It's, 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 it's got a bit of an edge, but it also, you know, sort of veers towards that uh, more, more melodic, more, uh, not exactly ballad -y, but, you know, the the other extreme on the album so um yeah and then of course at the end we have uh julian's debut on yaya <laughs> which julian i think i read something said years years later had he known it was going to end up on the album he would have played better i think julian was 11 at the time that he that he played drums yeah. on that um is there any <clears throat> the reason of putting yaya uh, 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 on the end of, I know it was probably just a fun session, but the the reason of putting it on walls and bridges that didn't have anything to do with the was a Morris Levy, the Morris Levy, absolutely, Boston, yes, and Yaya also then being on and a rather a full version of it being on the rock and roll album. Uh, so but, but there the, was, was part of the Big Seven agreement, and you you hear John at the beginning say, "Okay, yeah, yeah, well, this will get rid of that one then." Because he had to, I believe, pick three songs from the Big Seven catalog to go on his next album. So he's he's kind of joking that, yeah, this will get rid of it, just this little piano improv with, with Julian. Um, but I don't think Morris was, was pleased with that. <laughs> well, I thought the three that were going to be from the Big Seven catalog would have been Yaya yeah, yeah, and, uh, well, can't you can't catch me. Right? Right. And that had to be one of them. That was part of the agreement was you can't catch me was. And I think Angel Baby was actually one that might be part of that catalog, too. Or Sweet Little 16. We'll have to double check on this. I have to go back <laughs> and look at that. Yeah. When I, well, I try to dig into my memory banks and I always am troubled when I'm like unsure of something that I know I read recently. I or in my uh, discussions with Jay Bergen about the lawsuits uh, with with Morris Levy, um, I lost my train of thought here. It had to do with Wolds and Bridges and the timing. Actually, no, it was the timing of the fact that John had started recording the sessions, the rock and roll sessions with Phil Spector. Spector, as Alan pointed out, disappears, takes the tapes, and that project is now stalled. Now, Walls and Bridges, I guess, ended up kind of uh, firing up Morris Levy because instead of getting the album he was expecting, John puts out this album of original material, whereas the record you said you were going to do, which leads John then to hand over uh, rather hurriedly uh, what he has in the way of rough mixes that become the Roots album. Um so I, I, I'm wondering if this is all kind of like, if I have my facts all straight and how these two records are kind of are twisted together in a way. Even more so, they, they, they got in and they started to rehearse for the album. And then all of a sudden, John gets the tapes from rock and roll. So he does a couple of rough mixes on, on, on two or three of the tracks. And then they go into the Walls and Bridges sessions full, full bore and he doesn't visit it 
until after they're over. Right. John's work ethic um, on walls and bridges uh, seems to be uh, very strong with this album, uh, getting out of L.A. and getting away from the madness that went on in L.A. Whether or not there was any more residual madness in New York City, I don't know. But the summer of 74, he, it seems like he kind of got things together and got his uh, got the musicians and worked hard on this record over a rather set span of time, right? That's correct. Yeah, they spent the first two days uh, rehearsing, and then at the end of the second day, they tracked Beef Jerky, which was okay. probably the funnest one to play, which would which would be a good reason for doing it first. And what is the lyric? What are they saying in Beef Jerky? I forget. Piece of meat. <laughs> and the people that are shouting that are actually members of the orchestra from the oh, string really? section. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and what was it? Did he have a name for them on that album? That was one who was filled with I all the... I would have said it if I could have remembered what it was. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm thinking a little... Oh, no, yeah, the Philharmonic Orchestra. Orchestra, yeah. That's right. This was the... Uh, this John was having fun with the Plastic Ono Nuclear Band, in this case, after the Plastic UF Ono Band on, on Mind Games. So this would also be the last time we'd see any mention of the Plastic Ono Band until decades and decades later when Sean and Yoko revived it. Um, I got to tell you, as a teenager, all the, the Plastic Ono Band names got very confusing. I, I, I don't always... know if it was the same... Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I don't know if it was the same for you guys or not. Well, you know why? And it's something that's still, because I'm very detailed, I'm, I'm very anal and detail-oriented about certain things. Uh, when I'm on WFUV, if it's Elvis Costello and the Attractions or Elvis Costello and the Imposters, I'm going to tell you, I'm not just going to say, hey, that was Elvis Costello, because it's not, damn it. It's Elvis and the Imposters and the Attractions. I always found Lennon's records to be incredibly confusing, the way they were the way the credits were done, because it was seemed as though there was never two done the same way. Um, you had Live Peace in Toronto was a Plasticono band album. And Give Peace a Chance and Cold Turkey with Plasticono band singles, all from 60. Mm -hmm. Then Instant Karma comes out and it's John Ono Lennon. But it says Plasticono band in small print on the label on some pressings. So, and then, you know, then the name would come, the name would go, it would be on the cover, it wouldn't be on the cover. I always found that uh, very confusing. And in the case of Walls and Bridges and Mind Games, they were, the band was down to being an afterthought in the album credits. Well, the marketing push on Walls and Bridges was, was unmatched at the time, I think. I mean, Bruce Wendell and, and the, the whole crowd at Capitol, I re really pulled out all the stops. I mean, between the, the design and the artwork and the whole listen to this trope that uh, for all the promotion and, and his, his radio appearances were stellar. Um, did any of you guys hear the N.E.W. when it was on originally? Yes. No. Originally, you heard it, Ken? Yeah. Wow. I work with Dennis Elsis. Dennis is on WFUV with me. And so I, I've heard the stories many times and uh and um about how that came together and he didn't i don't think dennis believed it was going to happen even even at the moment that the doorman called from downstairs saying you have a guest on that saturday afternoon uh i don't think dennis believed that was really going to be john lennon down there uh but he threw on uh, chicago's ballet for a girl in buck cannon most aside two of the second chicago album and and I don't know if he went down to get his guests, so he sent someone down, and boom, John Lennon strolls in with records, and and uh, and they spend the next what? How many hours was it? Three, four hours, or just? No, it's probably about an oh. hour, and two hours. But so you heard it, Ken, when it took place originally. I think I missed the beginning of it, and then somebody told me that John was on the radio, and I rushed to hear it, mm -hmm. but. I talked to, to Dennis, I did an interview with him several years ago, which is on my website. And you talk about this magical time like I did before. It just seemed like it was all too good to be true. So here's John Lennon 
on the radio. And while he has this new album out, he can plug Ringo's new album and he can plug George Martin producing the Mahavishnu Orchestra. <laughs> and I'm going to see George when he's touring. And, you know, it's everything, you know. He brings you up to speed on what he's doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like you're talking to an older brother or something. You know, here's what I'm up to. And and he christens the Electric Light Orchestra, Son of Beatles. Yeah. Does a couple of commercials for local restaurants. Uh, one of my favorite moments in it is when uh, at some local bars, ladies' night, and then he mumbles, bet you Bowie's going to be there. Something to Bowie that effect. Bowie can get that in. Always, <laughs> yeah, that was always my favorite moment of the entire thing. Uh, he John said that he gave weather report. Yeah. Playing the DJ, you know. What was we, it? Just open up the window and look out. Something to that effect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so that was that was right at Walls and Bridges time. Um, another little fact about Walls and Bridges: we were talking before about how uh, whatever gets you through the night was John's first number one, and it was from that album in the U.S. That is. Um, it was also the first album to have two singles released from it. If you look back at John's albums, they all had one single, at least in the U.S. You had Mother from Plastic Ono Band. Imagine wasn't even a single in some countries initially, but was in the U.S. in 71. Sometime in New York City had its single. Uh, Mind Games had the title track. And then Walls and Bridges had... Um, whatever gets you through the night and number nine dream that now that would have been the the doings of capital uh or was john pushing for uh a second single off the record i i don't know that specifically but i would think that it was probably at the urging of capital since it was in a number one record you know they wanted to ride on the coattails of that Mm -hmm. And number I'm nine, sorry. Dream, ends up topping off at number nine on the Billboard charts. So um, we're talking about the sessions being very um, concise and extra material. We've learned that there wasn't a lot of really extra stuff out of mind games. Uh, and it seems as though the same thing with Walls and Bridges. There wasn't any rejected tracks or unfinished things that sat in the can uh, unless Save there's something move over Miss totally L. I'm sorry? Except for Miss o Move Over Miss L. Right. I probably cut you off. And 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 uh, and uh, Rock and Roll People was a Mind Games track. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Um, you know, I just wanted to say, because you, you were talking about the the two singles from Walls and Bridges. I think in some ways, John was involved with singles because he did admit that when Imagine came out, the record company wanted O Yoko to be a single and he didn't want it to go out as a single. You know, it wasn't a, a rocking song or maybe it was too poppy or, you know. But there's a, you know, there's an instance of him turning it down. And that's, that's a shame because those albums deserve to have second singles on them. There's no reason why Jealous Guy couldn't have been a single. Mm -hmm. And oh, Yoko. Now, why? Very... I don't know if Chip could shed some light on this. The thinking of Apple, I guess, Parlophone in the UK, why initially in 71 were no singles released from Imagine? Was there any. Actually, the, the, the album came out a month later as well. And it might have been something to do with that. Because Imagine was a single, I think, out of Shaved Fish in the UK. That's, that's correct. Uh, but not when 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 the actual album Imagine was released, which I always thought was odd, that it was a US hit single. Uh, and his John's first near miss, because I think that's st stalled at number two on the charts, or three. In the, in the US, number three. Three. On Billboard. <laughs> Billboard. And well, yeah, what was it back then? We had more. It was Cashbox, was another one. Cashbox. Yeah. yeah. Um, and actually, Karma went to number three as well. Right. And John's thinking was whatever gets you through the night would never hit number one if Instant Karma didn't make it to number one or Imagine didn't make it to number one. So that's why he kind of agreed 
yeah, I'll go, I'll go on stage with you. Mm-hmm. You know, I think if it makes it to number one, but he never thought it would. Um, okay, so here we are now, 2024. We're talking Walls and Bridges 50 years later, and <laughs> we just got done um, digging through our 50th anniversary box of mind games. Is it safe to assume in 2025 that we're going to get a Walls and Bridges set? Does anyone have any um, inside info on if that's cooking on the back burner? Uh, I mean, every album's been has been redone so far, except we don't. Well, whatever happened to sometime in New York City, but um, could twenty twenty? Could we be talking about the Walls and Bridges box set one year from now? I suppose so. I don't know anything in particular except for I think it was the uh, the Sirius Channel had. Uh, a handful of specials on mind games and on one of them they played the first take of number nine dream which was i think new to probably everybody that listened to it um hmm. very different more like the demo but it's you know in all these years of collecting we never had a good alternate studio take of that song hmm. and um but but to answer your question i think the box is definitely cooking. I don't know if we'll see it by the end of next year. I I can't imagine that it would be nearly as as, as encompassing as the mind games box. I hope not. Please, <laughs> please, I'm going to plead to the Lennon, John Lennon Empire. Do you, do you have any idea? Dollar. Do you have any idea what's going on with some time in New York City? Because Sean has said these cryptic things about how they're going to do something else about it. What do you, what do you think? I, I don't, again, I don't have any concrete information, but I think they're going to probably try and piggy tail some of it onto this daytime revolution movie. Hmm. And isn't there another documentary yeah. uh, coming yeah. out as well? One to I, one, I think. Yeah. I think we, we might see one to one on its own or, or as part of an, another box. Hmm. Uh, Darren, and, I'm sorry, Darren, you, you don't want another box set like Mind Games? No, no. I don't want another thousand dollar item okay. for for just just because. Yeah, I want to stay married. <laughs> if I bring in one more mega set. I was thinking. Um, I just actually, um, I don't know if I uh, told you guys this. This is completely off topic. We're talking now amongst friends. I was the winning bidder at the recent um, auction, tracks auction of Frida Kelly's uh, Beetle. Oh, cool. Or whatchamacall. I bought everything. No, 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 that not. I got her Christmas messages album. So, um, that is something I'm still sort of paying off um, <clears throat> as we speak now. Uh, so please, walls and bridges manageable. Don't don't put up any. I fear our rector sets of building walls and literal walls and bridges in your house while you're listening to the album. That's my worst nightmare. Something a little more manageable and space comes in handy. I'm admiring uh, the setup behind you, Chip, and that's new. Your everything's nice laid out on shelves. Everything looks great. Uh, you go down in my room down there, it looks like, you know, after a nuclear blast went on. But anyway, I got off topic. I did want to nice talk piece. about the Well, <laughs> It's a nice piece, the Frida set. Yeah, yeah, that was very I've always wanted the, to own all of the Christmas records. And um, I saw this and I'm like, hmm, huh? Come here a second. <laughs> I have a question. But anyway, I wanted, I did want to bring up, at least make mention of uh, Men Love Avenue. And again, as I was saying earlier on in the in the show, um, I got into Walls and Bridges many years after it came out. And at the time that John was murdered in 1980, I'm 15, and really only owned a f- handful of singles and shaved fish. And then I think I literally took some of the Christmas money for uh, Christmas of 80. And uh, I remember going to the store and buying sometime in New York City, Plasticono Band of Imagine. Walls and Bridges came later on. Uh, and I think I was more tuned into the mixes that appeared on side two of Menlove Avenue for a number of years in the mid 80s, 86, 
when that came out until I finally uh, got a copy, a new copy of Walls and Bridges. Um, I always like those mixes on Men Love Avenue. What are you guys' thoughts on side two of Men Love Avenue? I like it a lot. You know, in this day and age of things being stripped down, this is without all the production that you're used to hearing on Walls and Bridges. And I especially love that that take of Scared. You know, it's so bare and raw and intense. And just, you know, the arrangement of the song, of a song like Scared is so wonderful in the finished version. But when you just hear the pounding of the piano, boom, boom, <laughs> quarter notes, you know, that alone, it has a life of its own just in that arrangement. But I like hearing the development of the song. And um, there are times when, because there's also been bootlegs of the, the Walls and Bridges sessions that are not produced. It's just the band. And it sounds absolutely lively and fresh. And, uh, you know, I love all the strings and the orchestration that was added. But sometimes when you strip it all down and you don't hear that, you realize how great the songs are just by themselves. So for that reason, um, you know, I like that side too of Men Love Avenue a lot. Well, that rehearsal tape appeared, at least in my circles, for the first time in uh, summer of 1986, which is when it was bootlegged. Hmm. Um, so we were able to be familiar with all of those before Men Love Avenue came out. And it was kind of disappointing to see how much they processed it and edited things. Um, but, you know, it, it's great that we have that rehearsal tape and that it, it sounds as good as it does. Hmm. Yeah, the other thing that was I well because at that time you long before the internet, um, again still getting familiar with the catalog and learning about the music. The lack of liner notes on Men Love Avenue was very frustrating because I didn't quite understand what the whole idea of the album was. What was the purpose of this album? And side one was more of a mystery uh, uh, than side two. I knew all the songs that came from seventy four, but. Um, it, it, I guess there's a footnote to Walls and Bridges making mention of Side 2 of Men Love Avenue is essential. That was our first, like, legitimate bootleg release mm -hmm. of this stuff from these sessions from the summer of 74. What was going on with the artwork, Chip? Uh, you know, I mean, with the, with the original art, I mean, it's it's sort of lost now on CD and probably probably why they're going to do a thousand dollar box. Uh, you know, you have bits of the cover folding out and you can do it in different ways like those old. Do you remember, you You guys may be too young for this, but do you remember these things that came in gum cards called Valentine Foldies? And you can, you fold them all different ways and they give you completely different messages. This was a little bit like that. You know, and plus all of the drawings from his childhood and and all of that. What what was going on? What was? Do you know what was behind all that? Um, the artwork. I think it was Capital took it away from him. Um, John was talking to David Chef, and he'd said that up until Walls and Bridges, I'd made all of my own covers, and I was so insecure around Walls and Bridges, I let Capital do it. And you know, they they got a prize for it, which I thought was a bit funny. But that's the only one I didn't do the cover myself, and I don't like it because it's not clear. I appreciate the work the guy put into it, by the way, and he worked hard on it, and he did a good job for the kind of thing he was trying to make, but it was not my style. Mm -hmm. uh, he thought, it's confusing, it's a little gimmicky, but Capital must have been worried that I was going down the chute or something, so they tried to gimmick it up. Well, they did. Yep. Yeah. But on the and I other never hand, quite you know, we hadn't seen a lot of these pictures that he drew as a kid. I mean, in a way, it was it may have been gimmicked up, but it kind of gave us a glimpse of you know just just his his childhood in a way, or or you know just stuff that he had saved from all those years, and, and it was kind of interesting. There's some great stories behind some of those that that'll be in the book. Um, you know, one of it the the uh, Yoko's made a point of the. The, the drawing that's got the two riders on the horses. Mm -hmm. Well, she she's decided that the, the second rider looks like her. Sort of does. Yeah. yeah. 
The uh, photo I never made the connection between walls and bridges and this peek back at John's youth on these uh on uh, with the with the presence of the, the all the art were young uh, artwork um and what they were trying to connect there with the name of the album and if anything maybe they weren't just as an aside uh Angela Davis's biography which came out prior to the album had two back to back chapters named walls and bridges mm. so don't know if he took anything from that but it's just kind of an odd coincidence yeah do you know if the photo of john that's on the back cover of walls and bridges was more what he wanted you know with the glasses coming down like it's a pretty cool photo it is and and keltner's kind of the one that egged him on to do that um I think it might have been where he was leading. He he had uh, Gruen taking the headshots for the album, which eventually ended up in the Identikit uh, pictures. But uh, you know, we we can only figure that's what he something that he was going for. Mm. Okay. Also, Walls and Bridges was supposed to be a working title for Number Nine Dream, right? That's correct. Yeah. That and so long ago. Could you walk us through the different some of the differences between the original mix, which I think came out first and then came out on the signature box, and then the I think in around two thousand two, I'm not sure what year, um, Yoko remixed it, um, and I'm not sure right. if this is considered one of the more successful remixes or not. I, I can't remember, but I think at that point they were trying to kind of conclude the set weren't they i mean walls and bridges was almost one of the one of the last ones um and but to answer your question about the remixing i mean all of the albums had been remixed up to that point and uh i think there are three or four tracks on walls and bridges on the on the on the remixed version that they actually didn't the tapes weren't in good enough shape so let's hope that they've they found uh, something more suitable to work with, but uh, it, and it's a shame that that uh, disc has kind of gone by the wayside now. I mean, it was like you said in 2010 when they had the the cube that came out, that kind of became the new de facto standard Lennon box. Right. And all of these remixes, which some of which are fantastic, have gone by the wayside now and are, I think, out of print. Mm. I found that those uh, remixes, I was, with each one, it seemed like more liberties were taken with um, with the finished product to the point where I remember Walls and Bridges and sometime in New York City coming out at the same time as the last That's ones. Right. And there were, I mean, right down to the album cover of Walls and Bridges being altered and the second half of uh, sometime in New York City being almost completely left off. Um with the Christmas single tacked on as bonus tracks to me that was like the end of it and I was glad it was over because I didn't like all the liberties that were being taken that I assumed were all Yoko's ideas uh, with each album she would alter things um, mm -hmm. the first I think was Imagine and that was pretty faithful to the original mix and then Plastic Ono Band it seemed like with each one the mix well, was I think changing it's the production on his albums would become more adventurous obviously the jump from eight track to 16 track that some of these mixes are, are going to stray more from the originals and and it might be because you know some of this analog equipment isn't available anymore i mean think of the the line in scared where he says dance so so well and there's this great plate reverb that goes on in the back of it and i'm you know are they going to be able to reproduce that type of thing on the new mixes mm. Mm. How about we um, uh, begin closing things out with our picks for our favorite tracks on the album? Um, and I'll start, give you guys a chance to to shake the cobwebs loose. But I said earlier on that um, I was always fond of what you got, probably my favorite on the album, which was also the B-side of Number Nine Dream. He said, question mark. Uh, and then 
beef jerky was my other pick, uh, just because it was just a great little rock oddity. Uh, and that, I think, was the B-side of uh, whatever gets you through the night. Again, if my memory serves correct. Uh, I also would, uh, was I'm very fond of the opening track, uh, Going Down on Love. Um, and uh, I'll pick one wild card um, from the album. Uh, and I guess I have to go with um, Number Nine Dream, one of my all-time favorites of John's hits uh, from Walls and Bridges. Ken? Um, I've talked about scared a lot. <laughs> I mean, I love everything about that song. I love the build up and John's vocals when he's, as you were just saying, Chip, the well, 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 you do it so well, 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 it's so strong. And he's holding the note for so long. That's just, I mean, what great vocals right there from John. Mm -hmm. It's not just a great song, but the way he sings it, the arrangement, You know, everything about this album when it comes to the production, the brass, the orchestration is just so right. Um, you can certainly say that about Number Nine Dream. But I always love Stealing Glass. Um, you talk about holding a note for a long time. He does that in Stealing Glass. The vocals from John are just so, you know, off the charts. You know, it may not be Mother, <laughs> But I mean, his vocals are just so powerful throughout this album. And I, I've really grown to love Nobody Loves You When You're Down and Out. Yeah. And mm -hmm. ask Chip, because I think that didn't John say that he was envisioning Frank Sinatra singing that song? Yes. Uh, that was also written while he was in L.A. Yeah. At the end of 73. And he didn't want to record it it's because the, the this album with Spectre was going to be a combination of originals and oldies. So he and Phil were, were writing and they came up with Here We Go Again and then Nobody Loves You. And and John decided to hold on to Nobody Loves You because he said he didn't think he could do it justice at that time in his life. So I hadn't heard that that album, what became Walls and Bridges, originally was going to be a mixture of oldies and originals? No, no the, the rock and roll project was Spectre. Oh, so there would be originals in that? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Very interesting. Okay. Um, going Down on Love is a very unusual opening track to me. Usually you think of something that really kicks an album into high gear, like a rocker. This one's very slow and bluesy. And I love the percussion that's on it, the congas that are used. It's just a very unique song in its arrangement. Um, hey, Bless You is a gorgeous song. And it's one of those songs that I feel like um, almost like one day at a time. It has sort of like jazz leanings uh, involved. That's a little bit more complex, maybe uh, chord wise. And it's very laid back and it could fit in a light jazz feel. Um, John's contribution to the yacht rock movement. <laughs> I hate that expression. <laughs> I figured you would. All right. But those would probably be my favorites. And yes, I love whatever gets you through the night because I love the chemistry of Elton John and John Lennon. I, I've heard it enough, but um, they just sounded so good together. Would you be able to say, refresh my memory, Chip, how did that whole thing start with John Lennon working with Elton John? Uh, John met Elton in Los Angeles, uh, October of 73. And through Tony King. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so so Tony made the introduction. Elton went to one of the rock and roll sessions and saw everything get out of get out of control. Um, uh -huh. but the, 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 there was a, a kinship, there was a friendship there. And uh, you know, when John was doing the record that you know, Elton came into town, he'd just come in over on the, the SS France with, with Julian and Cynthia, who were coming over for a visit as well. So you know, there was some, there was some pot go at that point. And, uh, you know, like you said, it, it definitely kicked the song into another level. Right. Okay. I also wanted to know if you could answer these questions. I, when you have a different lineup of musicians and, and Walls and Bridges is a combination of old friends playing on the album, Klaus Foreman, Jim Keltner, uh, Nicky Hopkins is on there, but then mm -hmm. you've also got Eddie Matau playing mm -hmm. guitar um like and arthur jenkins on percussion i mean how are these people chosen would you know 
Well, Eddie goes back quite a long ways because he was on stage with, with John and Yoko at the Apollo Theater benefit. Right. Okay. Okay. So, so there was that connection quite a ways back. Um, as for Arthur, um, I, I can't tell you for certain how that came about. But, yeah. but no, it definitely was a, a com almost a completely different set of musicians. Um, Ken Asher. Sounds like Klaus has taken some bass lessons in the meantime. Um, I mean, he, he's had a lot of work through 74 working with Harry and, and, uh, um, but, uh, and, but, you know, we lost, uh, Gordon Edwards, we lost Spinoza, um, we lost, uh, I'm trying to remember how much Ken Ash was on it. Um, I know we did the string arrangements. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and it, it was definitely a different feel from mind games. I mean, we kind of dissected that to the nth degree and, and how important that the, the steel guitar and the bass lines were on that album. Well, now he's moved on to strings and, you know, more more contemporary sounding backing vocals uh, and, you know, more of a more of a slicker production. OK. All right. Would you happen to know um what the engineers on that album thought of John as a producer, Roy Sakala and um, Shelly Yakis and those people, because one of the great things we did an interview with David Spinoza and Kenny Asher on talk more talk. And there's actually uh, Kenny said something, which is in the mind games book that accompanies the archival box set about remembering how John would have an arrangement in his head and he would know exactly what he wanted. And even if, they went away for a week and came back. As soon as they spoke, he knew he remembered every single detail of what was in his head. So in terms of arrangements, John probably knew what he wanted. Although there are times it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to define the way that he works, because when you're talking about mind games, there was that whole week and they worked on songs and you you knew that the lyrics weren't finished on certain songs and they had to be refined so it all had to be done in a hurry um but in terms of the arrangements maybe he was much more skillful at that and had more of a mind for that but there were no horn arrangements on that album john did them and wrote them together with the musicians they came up with them not on the spot but John went in, told him what he wanted, and together they worked all those out. But there weren't any charts written for those. Mm -hmm. But still, um, his, he, he kind of knew what he when he saw Kenny again. He remembered right. every of what he wanted each musician to do. Well, well, he cut his solo production teeth on Mind Games, and you know, I, I think we we definitely. And then he went on to do Pussy Cats, so he's he's got a couple more under his belt now, and. Yeah. Um, but as for what the engineers had to say about it, I, I, I'd have to go back to my interviews with the guys. Okay. All right. Did we get your song picks, Alan? We didn't. <laughs> um, yeah, I felt like um, I felt like Ken pretty much chose every track on the album. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to keep mine to just a few. Um, number nine, Dream would be like at the top of the list and um, surprise, surprise, which comes right after it would be next. Um, I love those two. I mean, I, I, I love whatever gets you through the night and a lot of other stuff on the album, but those would be my two tops. And then, um, you know, there's something about bless you. that sort of just seems a little unusual as a John track. I, it reminds me a bit in a way, and I don't think the songs themselves are that similar, but it, in spirit, it's a bit like Dylan's Forever Young. You know, you got these two songs that, that have this same kind of, you know, atmosphere in a way, you know, or, 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 or spirit. Um, so there's that. And, uh, you know, if I keep looking at the list, I'll, I'll, I'll go through every track. Just keep adding songs. <laughs> so and so those are the ones for you alan yeah i think so all right before alan picks the whole album go to chip now for your picks well i get it you know every song has something about it on it 
uh, I think my favorites would have to be Scared, um, Steel and Glass, uh, Nobody Loves You, um, Keep Going. But but those would probably be the top three. And there are just some great moments on the album, you know, like when, when John screams, stay in E, baby, in the, in the middle of Scared. <laughs> You know, just all these all these great little asides. Um, you know, the 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 bless you scat. He, he was always saying that that Mick Jagger kind of appropriated that for miss you. Um, you know, so so if you you double the time on on John Scat, you'll get the da 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 da. And um, you know, there are just so many great moments. The 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 wolves howling at the beginning is scared from from the uh sound effects record that he used on elephant's memories album uh it's just it's, it's hard to pick just a couple which i think you guys have, have evidenced yourselves yeah i also would like to add what you got is a terrific song and i always remember there was one night when on david letterman's show <laughs> paul schaefer and his band went into what you got which i thought was really oh, well. cool because it was never a hit you know, shows that they knew the song, obviously. But, uh, yeah. And I remember John saying how it was influenced by uh, the OJs. For the love of money. That guitar riff that you hear throughout the song. come it, That's where it comes from. Right. So, I would have loved to have had more songs like what you got from John. Mm. Yeah. So, we'll all reconvene in a year when the... Uh... Yeah. Thousand dollar box comes out. We'll we'll do a fiftieth anniversary rock and roll uh, show, and by then be talking about the sometime in New York City bridges combination set. I don't know. Chip, thank you so much for taking your little time My out, pleasure, and allowing us to pick at your brain, um, and uh, and celebrate walls and bridges with us 50 years later here on Things We Said Today. Uh, Chip, um, you want to uh, tell everyone the website and all things Chip Mattinger that we could find on the internet? Uh, well, primarily there are the two books. Uh, there's the Leninology, Strange Days Indeed, which is the day-by-day -day of John and Yoko's life and art together. And the other is Eight Arms to Hold You, which... Uh, is old enough to drink now and is almost going to be 25. It's going to be 25 wow. next year. Wow. Which is hard to believe. Um, but both of those are available at linenology.com. Uh, Eight Arms is only available in an electronic format now. Uh, still have the, the paperbacks of Linenology and uh, uh, a few hardbacks, I think, are still out there in the garage. But uh, You'll have to go here because Amazon has decided that I'm not a suitable seller and have removed the book from their listings. Actually, I was just looking before at Amazon and there's one book and there's nothing else. You know, the way you search things on Amazon, you'll end up still getting five pages of things. By the end, it'll be deodorants for your closet, but you'll start out, you know, searching for, but it was just one book and I'm like, Chip angered the Amazon gods. I sure did. I don't know what I did, but they're ticked off. Yeah. They want you getting, so for getting down to put out a new book. That's what they want. Want a new book to sell. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chip. Chip Manager here on Things We Said Today, Talking Walls and Bridges. Walls and Bridges 50 years later. Thanks so much to Chip Manager for spending time with us again here at things we said today and um again his website was leninology.com uh where you could uh, find out more about uh, those two essential books that chip has uh given us and that brings us to the end of this things we said today so let's just wrap things up with our personal information and other things going on for us all individually starting off with ken Okay. Uh, first of all, if any of you would care to email me privately, you can do so at uh, my email address, everylittlething at att.net. My other uh, Beatles talk show podcast, which is called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, runs every other Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. 
And uh, the most recent show that we did was uh, reviewing that new documentary, Daytime Revolution, which covers that one week in February of 1972, when John and Yoko co-hosted The Mike Douglas Show. So that was a really fun conversation that we had on that program. We're going to be doing one this coming Monday, which is the 28th of October. And we're going to be celebrating, hopefully not being too critical, of uh, the film Give My Regards to Broad Street, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary. We did a show earlier this year on the album for Give My Regards to Broad Street. This time, we're just focusing on the film. And we're going to have Edward Crawford uh, on the show. He has his own website, Call Me Mr. Broad Street. He's a big Broad Street fan, and uh, he's going to comment about it. And also Dylan Seavey, who's been a guest on my channel on the two legs podcast um he will be joining us because he had a chance to listen to ringo's new country album so he's going to have some comments to make about it don't know how much he can say but a little sneak preview uh for ringo's country album called look up due out january the 10th also if you want to listen to my own radio program on the beatles which i've been doing now for 42 years called every little thing the easiest way to do that is to go to wfdu's website and which is uh, wfdu.fm go to their archival uh, shows page type in the title of every little thing and they have posted the last two shows that have aired on the station and each show runs for two weeks so you can listen any time of the day and uh on my own youtube channel ken michaels radio i've been pretty busy there lately um, you may have heard me mention in my news segment that there is uh, a George Harrison tribute taking place in Massachusetts on November 1st and 2nd. Uh, the George Harrison tribute, which is also known as Harry Fest. I interviewed the married couple of Wayne and Rachel Cabral. Uh, they have been putting on this show for the past 20 years. They talk about the history of it, what to expect for that weekend. And we also did my feature called The Deeper You Go, in which I asked them to name 10 deep tracks from George Harrison's solo career, anything but singles, anything but hits, that they feel uh, deserves to be recognized as among the best of George's solo career. So I did that show. I also did a Deeper You Go show on John Lennon, with Beatley Tone, who has his own uh, Beatles channel on YouTube under Beatley Tone, very popular. And um, so he picks 10 deep tracks from John Lennon's solo career. And then one other thing I just did was to interview my friend Javier Lubinsky, who lives in Argentina. And because Paul just did a couple of shows in Buenos Aires, he attended those. So he talks a lot about those and his history of seeing Paul in concert. He started seeing Paul. He's much younger than most of us. He started seeing Paul in 1993. So he talks about that band, the band of the last 22, 23 years that he's been touring with, the shows that he's been to, what the audience is like there in Buenos Aires. Is it any different than what we have here? Um, so we have those three shows happening on Ken Michaels radio. That's the name of my YouTube channel. If you can, please subscribe if you haven't done so already. And then don't forget about my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, where you've got Beatles trivia happening every two weeks at the moment. And it's always a lot of fun, a mixture of difficult and also some easier trivia and Beatle games all mixed in. There's 10 prizes of which you can pick one if you're a winner to pick from books, audio, video, and um, that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. And that's everything. That's a lot. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> and Alan? Um, okay. You can reach me uh, at uh, on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. You can write to all three of us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com you can find our shows posted lots of different places um, on youtube is the video one um, that's sort of the uh like the one we all watch 
Uh, and Podbeam is audio only, and it goes to Apple Music and iHeartRadio and all sorts of other places they distribute. We don't even really have the full list, I don't think. Um, but the way to find them, basically, or find the YouTube one, certainly, is to check our group Facebook page. Things We Said Today video podcast has a logo that looks like this. And um, that's basically it. Darren? All right. And as for me, you can catch me on WFUV Monday through Thursday nights. I start at 10 p.m. till 2 in the morning. And Saturday afternoons, I'm on the air from 1 until 4. Uh, WFUV is in New York City at 90.7 FM. Uh, or you can listen on our website, WFUV.org. Or get our app. It's another way you can listen, download that. Um, so that's when I'm on the air. And if you want to find me on Facebook, that's the best way to reach out to me individually. Two Facebook pages. So just do a search, Darren DeVivo. You'll find probably both pages. And uh, you can send me a friend request or follow on the or like or whatever it is on the other page. And, um, and then we'll be in touch. And uh, I guess that's basically it. I'm trying to think if there's anything... Else, I need to touch on. I don't think so. That's yeah. Ken Michael's finger, and he's gonna <laughs> have he has a word for us too. <laughs> There's one important news item that I completely forgot about. Why? And why don't you share it with us? How could I not bring this up? That Paul I don't know. Paul McCartney performed now and then in concert when he resumed his Got Back tour. Uh, in South America, in Uruguay, and the tour goes on uh, through December the 19th, the Got Back Tour. I just wanted to know between the two of you, because I'm sure you've heard recordings of it, were you surprised that he's doing this, and uh, what did you think of the performance? I was actually surprised when I first heard it, and then the more I thought of it, it sort of made sense <clears throat> that he's performing it. And it seems to be a fairly easy song for him to sing. Now, I've seen various clips. And you can't really go by sound. I, I mean, because I inspect his voice, how he sound? Everything I've heard, he actually sounds a better than I anticipated he would sound at this point. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I was maybe mildly surprised at first. And then the more I thought of it, it, you know, it makes sense that he's performing it. And, uh, I mean, it, it makes more sense that he's doing that now and then now than all the years that he kept rolling out in spite of all the danger, for example. Um, so I, I'm glad he's doing that. And we'll see if, uh, we'll see what 2025 holds, if you know what I mean. Mm. So. All right. Alan, what did you think? Um, I thought it was okay. I, I, I like the studio recording of it somewhat better. Um, if you're going to listen to it, um, and you haven't heard it yet, um, the one to look for is the broadcast version of the mm -hmm. October 5th concert in Buenos Aires, because that is, it's a broadcast, it's a soundboard, it sounds as good as you're going to hear it. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was nice to hear because it is what it is, you know, and, uh, I was a little surprised that he was doing it, but then as Darren said, it, it, it does make sense in a way. So, so, mm -hmm. and, uh, and yeah. it's a, a, you know, something new for his set. Can't say he's done that before. Well. It's just in my podcast on my channel, I like to bring this up because, yeah, I'm very pleased that he's doing now and then, and he sounds great doing it, and the band sounds fantastic. I love Abe's harmonies with Paul, and um, I also think that, that uh, well, Rusty does a sensational job doing the Paul McCartney lead of Paul imitating George, <laughs> and it sounds a lot like the record there, but I always like to question my guests why he's doing this when he never did free as a bird or real love mm. in concert so 
you know, a lot of a lot of people are under the assumption that this is Paul's baby because he helped to bring it to life. It was something that really meant a lot to him. And then there is that theory about the last thing that John ever said to him was think about me now and then, which he talked about with the whole my old friend story with Carl Perkins. You know, so there could be that element to it, but you know, he's had the opportunity to do the anthology songs all these years, but he hasn't done anything till now. And that's the last news item, I promise. And that's a great way to wrap things up uh, with that news item on Now and Then, Paul McCartney performing it live. So for Alan Cozen and Ken Michaels, I'm Darren DeVivo. Look for us again in a couple of weeks. We have some pretty cool things on the burner uh, as we near the end of 2024 here on Things We Said Today. Take care, everyone.